Hey, thank you very much. Um, like you heard, my name is Dr. Travis Craddock. I'm here all the way here from Florida. First off, I'd like to thank the conference organizers to inviting me to this, uh, this great conference and to your wonderful country. I've never been here before. It's a, it's a very great place. Um, and I'd also like to start off by thanking the funding uh, providers for this research. Uh, primarily, my work has been in uh, sister-related illness, Gulf War illness, so that comes primarily from the U.S. Department of Defense. But the work that we have done with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, has come from the, um, the NIH. Um, these awards have not just been to myself, uh, but to Dr. Nancy Klimas, who's the director of our institute, Dr. Mary Ann Fletcher, who's our uh, director of our uh, immunology laboratory, Dr. Luwag Nathanson, the director of our genomics laboratory, and Dr. Gordon Broderick, who was the previous director of the Clinical Systems Biology Group, but who now whole, um, runs the Systems Biology Group up in Rochester General Hospital in New York. Uh, this is our team. Uh, this is uh, the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine at Nova Southeastern. We're a large group. Uh, this group was started about seven years ago by Dr. Nancy Klimas. Uh, it's really the brainchild of Dr. Klimas. Uh, with our main mission to advance the knowledge and care of people with complex chronic illness, Gulf War illness and chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, through the integration of research, clinical care and education. Uh, we've heard a lot about MECFS, uh, chronic multi-symptom disorder, primarily described by fatigue greater than six months with not alleviated by rest. Uh, in the U.S., this affects approximately 400,000 to 900,000 Americans. Uh, this is an old statistic but I believe it, it's, it's either growing or, or staying constant. Uh, there's been estimates that this is a cost to the economy of about $9 billion in lost productivity annually, uh, and to date there's been no treatment found. So our goal is to make progress in this area, and from my standpoint, we're, we're trying to do it rapidly. Uh, the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, INIM, is uh, made up of four, five main uh, uh, cores, with the, the central core being the clinic itself. So this is directed by Dr. Nancy Klimas, where we have a fully functioning clinic, where we see individuals with MECFS, and they receive clinical care. From there, individuals are recruited for, for uh, clinical studies, and then uh, through clinical research, uh, through uh, clinics down in, in um, the Miami area, as well as in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, we assess individuals, we, we take blood measures, biological measures, clinical measures, symptom measures, and then it proceeds through the, the pipeline of our, of our institute. First, it goes to the immu, uh, immunology and genomics lab where the biological data is processed. Uh, then that source of data is directed to the clinical systems biology group where we try and make sense of the data, either by analyzing the data directly or by building theoretical models and comparing it to, to biological data. And then when we come up with leads for, for clinical trials, we try these out in animal models. This is primarily, so far, only for Gulf War illness, uh, but we're looking into trying to define or um, create animal models for chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, the Clinical Systems Biology Group, which I head, is uh, provided here. We're made up of a group of uh, staff. I don't know if you can see that. Hang on. Our, our staff, as well as graduate students and undergraduate volunteers. Our clinical research takes a, a dynamic approach. So when we assess individuals, primarily we don't just look at their resting uh, baseline values. We uh, uh, submit them to a challenge, which is uh, in the form of an exercise challenge. Because CFS, ME-CFS, is a fatiguing illness, we seek to perturb that illness by putting them on an exercise challenge. And then we measure their their biological response over time across that exercise challenge. At minimum, we take three measures in time, once at baseline, once at peak exercise activity as determined by VO2 max, and then finally about four hours after uh, that VO2 max um, time point. This was our initial design, that's uh, what the baseline is for, for all of our future dynamics uh, challenge studies. Uh, currently we're up to nine measures in time, which are interspersed throughout those um, throughout those three time points, as well as a follow-up 24 to 48 hours later. Our laboratory analysis is primarily done on PBMCs, peripheral mononuclear blood cells, uh, and we look at hormones, cortisol, the sex steroid system, uh, uh, NPY, as well as uh, other immunological measures such as flow cytometry, immune cell counting, uh, multiplex elysis for uh, cytokine assays, 
And uh, through uh, Lubov instances, we've been making headway into the genomics area of microarray expression, um, nanostring, RNA sequencing, and DNA methylation studies. Now, my group, we're, we're responsible for looking at all this data. So we get reams and reams of data, uh, especially with this genomics information. We got, you know, thousands of measures per individual per time point, and we're trying to make sense of this. Our main goal is to create a modeling and simulation environment to describe the combined neuroendocrine immune system and then use that, that model to try and predict treatment courses for complex chronic illnesses. Now, what I'm about to describe to you is not specific to ME-CFS, although I will be framing it in the, in the light of ME-CFS, but this is a general uh, um, a process that we apply to all of the illnesses that we're looking at, Gulf War illness, ME-CFS, our inroads in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease as well. So basically, we're trying to create a virtual you, uh, a virtual individual in which we can test treatment courses on before moving into the, uh, the clinical space. Uh, this modeling effort is made up of three main steps. One, we, we want to identify the, the systems, the putative targets, the markers that are, are specific to the illness. What is it that's important to model? There's so much information out there. We can't possibly model it all. It's too computationally expensive. So we need to hone in on what is it that's different in the first place. What's different between ill and the control group? And then from that point, construct a model. And then from that model, compare it to data, ensure that the model reproduces the data and then start to perturb the model, simulate what the response would be to some sort of external uh, uh, stimulation, either um, an onset uh, condition or a treatment condition. Uh, in that case, we try to optimize treatment, so then we go through an optimization process to try and find the best possible treatments with the least invasive uh, treatment course. Once we get there, then we try and minimize any sort of off-target interactions or any adverse effects that may uh, affect an individual. Once we get to that point and we have our best candidate therapies, then we go back to the clinicians and we say, this is what we've come up with. In cases where it's completely off the wall, they say, I don't believe that, and they may go to the next, the next treatment course. Uh, when they find something that seems plausible, then we'll try it in an animal model, and if that's successful, then we can move on into the actual clinical trials. So I'm gonna start, uh, just before I get onto this, I'm going to try and get through um, uh, steps one, two, and hopefully three, but I, I don't think I'm going to be able to, to talk too much about the third point. If I do have time, I will. Okay, so the first, the first aspect that we try and do is try and identify these putative targets. Uh, one aspect that we've used is, is the whole canvassing of gene expression uh, data. This is through microRNA analysis, or sorry, um, uh, messenger RNA analysis, not micro. Um, so what we start with, we started with gene expression data. In this case, I'm going to be talking about ME-CFS. Uh, these individuals are female primarily. Uh, our research, because of, we believe, the role of the sex steroid system in, in the process, we separate males and females, and we treat them separately. We don't uh, uh, mix. Uh, so these are ME-CFS women, uh, and they're defined under the FACUDA definition. Uh, we had a group of 23 ME-CFS uh, individuals and 15 healthy controls. And what we do is we do the, the normal processing of, of the um, microarray uh, plates uh, through transformations and normalizations. And then what we do is we compare illness groups to healthy controls for a set of predefined modules. And these modules are clusters of genes that are known to interact, uh, or at least their gene products are known to interact via the protein, protein, uh, human protein protein interaction network. So we define these groups of genes that function together uh, based on the human protein-protein interaction network, and we compare that group of proteins from the ill group to the healthy control group. And we're not looking for uh, um, total uh, change between uh, the, the, the modules. We're looking at each, each gene uh, in this module group. We look at how far is the ill group away from healthy control. So it can be either overexpressed or underexpressed, and we take the average of that absolute value and use that to rank the difference of that gene module compared to healthy control. Uh, once we do that, we look for those ones that are, are uh, affected. Okay, so we rank them and we look for the ones that have the highest degree of difference from healthy control. And then anything that doesn't meet that criteria, we, we throw it away. Once we get that group of affected modules, what we do then is we correlate the uh, um, uh, function of the module with symptom severity. And then we um, remove any, any um, uh, modules that do not correlate with, significantly with symptom severity. 
Once we get this uh, significant correlation set, we take that, that uh, uh, group of genes and then we compare the gene products to a pharmacogenomics database. So what we're doing is we're cross-referencing the genes that we've highlighted with actual drugs that are known to uh, affect the, the um, products of those genes. So what we're looking for is we're looking for targetable uh, differences within the illness. And once we find those, then that's the, the results that I'm going to be presenting here. So this is the uh, analysis that we did for female ME-CFS. So in total, we had uh, uh, 4,620 uh, um, gene functional modules, okay, and that's made up of 8,602 genes. So it's, by no means is it a, a complete uh, analysis of all, all the, the, the genome. Um, of that 4,620 4, genes, we're looking at the top 1%, so approximately 50 modules is where we're drawing the, the cutoff line. So we look at those 50 modules, and what it has defined is roughly 437 genes uh, from that, that total set of 8,602. And that's the map that you're seeing over there on the left-hand side. We take those, those gene functional modules, and then we annotate them using the consensus uh, pathway database. And what that does is look for overrepresentation of those genes within known pathways. So the reactome pathways, the keg pathways, uh, the PID pathways. And it tries to classify what, what, what function do these genes play together. Uh, and then we map it all out. So because these modules are not distinct, they do share some genes amongst them, what you're getting is relations between them, and that's what's shown over there on the left-hand side. Now, I'll, I know it's hard to see, but I'll, I'll zoom in on, on them in a minute. So what we have here is the blue nodes are individual pathways, and then the uh, yellow or green uh, nodes surrounding those, those are genes that belong to that, to that uh, module. And then anywhere where you see a gene which has a line between two of the pathways, that's a shared gene between the two, 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 two functional modules. Now, there's three main areas of interest that we found in this analysis, um, and I'm highlighting them here. So you can see that there's these general clusters in this area, this area, and this area down here. And we've loosely defined these as B cell and T cell receptors, uh, transformer and growth factor beta, or TGF beta, and tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. So this is the, the, the um, B cell and T cell receptor network. So you can see here that there's many of these uh, modules that are defined by this moniker of T cell and B cell receptors, as well as it pulls into the whole idea of adaptive uh, immune system response, uh, cell adhesion molecules, and this uh, strange one here, which is axon guidance. Now, at first, people, when they first see this, they say, oh, it's related to something in the brain. But remember, we're not looking at anything in the brain. We're looking only at, at blood cells. So this is, this is a definition of what these, uh, these cells may be doing in a known pathway. Now, this axon guidance is similar to re rearrangement of the, um, uh, the actin cytoskeleton. And as we heard in the previous talk, this happens at the uh, immune synapse between two cells, that reorganization of the actin cytoskeleton. And you can imagine that in, in um, um, immune cell signaling and, and uh, crosstalk with one another. Um, here is the TNF-alpha section. I, when I was listening to the previous talk, I hadn't heard about the, the TRIP receptors. So I quickly scanned this, and I did find uh, TRP-C4AP. So that's a TRIP-4C associated protein. Just because these TRIP receptors have not appeared in these, uh, in these modules does not mean that they're not affected. It's just where we slice the uh, um, analysis, they, they weren't coming up. And then in future here, we have uh, uh, TGF beta. And this is tied uh, more tightly to the tacrolimus cyclosporin pathway. Uh, but uh, as we'll see in the future, the, uh, none of the ta tacrolimus cyclosporin pathway lines up with, with symptomatology. So what we did here was is then we took these, these clusters and we take those, those main modules and we regress the, the uh, um, expression of the, the components of those modules onto the symptom severity scores. So our symptom severity scores are measured by the SF36, uh, the uh, short form 36 health survey, the multidimensional fatigue inventory, the MFI, uh, the Krups um, uh, fatigue severity scale, the sickness impact profile, and then the Pittsburgh sleep quality index. So for the B cell and T cell receptor cluster, we find that uh, several of the go back there, sorry, several of the measures uh, correlate strongly with uh, um, the, the overactivation or underactivation of these modules. Now these are all, because there's so many measures that we've done here, these are all corrected for false discovery uh, at a p-value of uh, um, 0.05 or less and a false discovery rate of 0.05 or less as well. 
So the value that you see on the top, that's the, the p-value associated with the, the regression and the correlation or the R-squared uh, value um, shown below here. So we can see that for the most part, it's the adaptive immune system and this axon guidance that correlates most strongly with the majority of these, uh, of these severity measures, uh, with the individual B cell receptors and T cell receptors only uh, covering a few of them, and cell adhesion only with physical limitations. Uh, for the TNF, uh, the TNF, TNF alpha cluster, we find that uh, this is the one that, that correlates most strongly with the majority of the, the severity, uh, symptom severity scores. Uh, primarily uh, module 41, TNF alpha, as well as these measures of the innate immune system and apoptosis. And then finally, the, um, the role of the TGF beta cluster only seem to correlate strongly with the, um, the pain, the pain measure, with nothing else, which we found was quite interesting. So finding this, what we did then was is take the, the genes from these identified modules and we cross-reference them with these pharmacogenomics database. So when we do this cross-referencing of the uh, uh, 400 and roughly 37 uh, genes, we find uh, 242 gene-drug interactions available in this database. Um, this corresponds to 92 FDA-approved drugs uh, and only 39 targetable gene products. Uh, in the treatable targets, 37 of the 50 modules that I identified previously were actually targetable, and only 23 of those 37 were actually the ones that were correlated with symptomatology. And the, of these 23, this is, includes that adaptive immune system, the B cell and T cell receptors, and the tumor necrosis factor alpha. Of those, um, of those uh, gene products that are targetable, only 11, when we look at individually those genes, were they significantly different between MECFS and healthy control. So we, we only 11 of the, of the uh, uh, 437 that we initially identified. And these are um, uh, nuclear receptor coactivator 1, uh, which I'll point at in a minute here, um, tumor necrosis factor receptor alpha, or associated factor 1, and the other one I want to point out is FKBP5. Um, so if we look here, what we're looking at here is here's uh, TRAP1. This is tumor necrosis factor, tumor necrosis factor alpha associated factor 1. Uh, we have uh, anything that inhibits tumor necrosis factor alpha is coming up, as well as this uh, um, nuclear receptor coactivator 1, um, which is targeted mainly by tamoxifen, which is a, uh, um, something that targets the estrogen receptors. Now, what this is, is suggesting here is that we're dealing with something that, that's talking about hormone regulation and TNF-alpha suppression. Um, again, this is, this is all preliminary work. We're just kind of spitballing with this and pointing it out. Uh, but it will be important in the, in the next step of the, the process. Uh, the next thing here is this FKBP5. Uh, Nancy uh, pointed out to me recently that chronic pain after trauma may depend on your stress gene. So this FKBP5 is something that sequesters the glucocorticoid receptor. So what it does is normally in, in the, the process of the HPA activation or hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis activation is when you're stressed out, your body produces cortisol. That cortisol binds to glucocorticoid receptors and it sets up a negative feedback loop to, se uh, to suppress the production of more cortisol. Now what this FKBP5 does is it latches on to the uh, glucocorticoid receptor and sequesters it, which means that your body produces cortisol but it doesn't receive the signal to stop producing cortisol. So we found that, uh, that to be quite interesting and it suggests a role for um, the HPA axis in, in modulation of this disease, which is consistent with literature. Okay, so we've kind of de defined three main areas of, of regulation. We're talking about hormone regulation, we're talking about immune regulation, primarily TNF-alpha uh, and B-cell and T-cell receptor signaling, uh, as well as this stress uh, modulation. So that first study kind of identifies main areas that we want to include in, in our analysis. So when we build the model, we kind of want to incorporate that. Um, so the three main areas, again, immune system, the endocrine system, and then because we're dealing with the, this HPA axis and the HPG axis, we're going to be dealing with the nervous system as well. Now, all three of these systems, I mean, generally they're studied in isolation, but in the body we're not isolated uh, uh, systems. We're systems that interact with one another, okay? So the immune system talks to the endocrine system. The endocrine system modulates your, your, your nervous system. The nervous system sends signals to the immune system and so forth. There's a crosstalk between all of these systems. Okay, so we must consider all of them 
when we're, when we're trying to build a model to describe this chronic multi-symptom, i.e. multi-system illness. Okay, and what, another thing that this might be pointing out is that we may not be looking for one single target. We may be looking for multiple targets or multiple interventions in order to, to, um, to treat this complex illness. So in this approach, what we do is starting from that base of the systems that we want to look at, we comb through the literature and try and construct a theoretically sound model of regulation. So we're looking through the literature of physiology and biochemistry, trying to describe the immune system, the, the stress axis system, the sex steroid system, and how they all talk to one another. Okay? Uh, initially, we did this by brute force with grad students reading papers and compiling information, and to the best of our knowledge, constructing uh, um, uh, regulation models. Uh, we, in, the, in present, we're trying to move towards a machine-driven uh, process using natural language processors and so forth. Once we can do, define this model, then we can start to simulate the behaviors of the model to make sure that it produces behaviors that are known to um, uh, uh, the, the known physiological responses, and then trying to perturb it using external factors such as um, either a viral infection or stress or other chemical uh, perturbations. And then from that, identify the, the sequence of events to return the system to, uh, to, the, to a healthy state. Now, this is our main hypothesis, and this was, this was uh, kind of the brainchild of Dr. Gordon Broderick, uh, and I was his postdoc at the time. So the idea was is that we have these complex regulatory systems, all with this crosstalk uh, wired back and forth. And because of the complexity of that system, you may not be, the, the complexity of the system may afford not just one stable behavior to the system, but multiple stable behaviors to the system, okay? So the idea is, is that the ball is your current uh, physiological state, and this is your healthy homeostatic basin of attraction, okay? So this is where you'd like to sit normally. If everything was calm and it was a peaceful day and you're sitting outside, this is where you would sit. But then you have a stressor that comes along, either you're, you get a, a, a mild infection or you realize that you have a grant due, you know, at midnight tonight, or some other life stressor, and it picks you up out of that happy homeostatic basin and it drops you somewhere in the vicinity and your body starts to regulate itself and it sloshes around and you kind of you know, dance around this bowl and eventually come back to rest when you've calmed back down, okay? Now, in a case where there is some sort of severe uh, um, perturbation, whether it be under high load of stress followed up by a chemical exposure or a viral exposure, it may be enough and strong enough to lift you out of this normal, healthy homeostatic basin and carry you over some sort, of, some sort of protective barrier that normally keeps you within that space and drop you in the vicinity of some other homeostatic basin. So you've been stressed out, you've uh, undergone some sort of uh, viral infection, uh, there's some sort of chemicals in the air, whatnot, I'm not, I'm not saying what it is, but it's enough to pick you up and drop you somewhere else. Now, when your body relaxes, you take all of those perturbing factors away, the, the stress of the illness is gone, the chemicals are gone, the virus is gone, you then come to rest somewhere in this alternate homeostatic basin. Now when you're stressed out or you undergo a, a new viral infection or another exposure, you're allowed to, again to cycle around this basin, but you're not behaving the exact same way. You're behaving in some sort of alternate pattern. It may be different from healthy control, it may, some aspects may look the same, some aspects may look different, but in some way you're, you're behaving differently. So that's our, our main hypothesis, is that that's what may be driving, at least in part, not completely, but at least in part, some of the chronicity of these illnesses. So the idea then is if, if this alternate uh, uh, behavior, this alternate regular, regulatory mode is contributing to the illness, we should be able to define an, uh, a treatment course that picks you up out of that alternate basin of attraction and flips you back over the hill and allows you to fall back down into healthy regulation. So that's the, the hypothesis that, that we're looking towards and we're trying to optimize the treatment that will get you back up over that hump. So this is a, um, some work that, that's a little bit older now, it's about uh, five years old. Uh, this was our initial stab at looking at the complex HPA, HPG immune system. So this is for uh, the female system, we also did it for males. Um, now what we have here is, is the HPA axis, your hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, and it describes your body's stress response. This is a very primitive 
immune system that just describes uh, Th1 and Th2 cell signaling back and forth with innate, uh, innate immune response. And uh, this is your female gonadal HPG, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Now, because of the complexity of the uh, um, female gonadal axis and the regulatory cycle that it undergoes, we weren't able to capture the dynamics of the, of the uh, HPG axis for females in one model. So we had to come up with four different models that describe the way that it's regulated. And this can be roughly um, uh, um, grouped into phases of ovulation, uh, the follicular phase, the luteal phase, and the, uh, the menstrual phase. Okay, so we have these four models, and they, they each follow their own uh, um, regulation. And then what we, we wanted to do, initially we tried to, do, to uh, apply a ordinary differential equation based model, some sort of mathematical modeling to this. But the problem with that is, is in order to, to provide a detailed model, you need to have the detailed parameters. You need to know how strongly, uh, you know, the, the, um, the stimulation of the pituitary gland by uh, CRH well, uh, how much it causes ACTH to be produced. You know, what is the rate that it's being produced? What is the rate that it's being degraded? What is the, what is the time period that, that, that this is uh, uh, um, undergo, uh, being followed? What is the time period that this is undergoing? Now, for these, these uh, um, um, axes in isolation, those values are known. But for the crosstalk between these axes, that is, very, is not very well known. So people, if you look through in the literature, you'll find that you know, we know that cortisol can suppress uh, um, your uh, TH1 axis, uh, but it, that's all it says, is that it does suppress it. It doesn't give you a rate for uh, uh, what this process is undergoing. So we can't apply the parameters to this system. So what we decided to do is we decided to apply a logic-based modeling. So not looking at the time period and the levels of, of, of which this would occur, but we want to just look at what is logically possible in this system. So in this case, uh, these arrows are just showing an association so that, you know, the red lines are showing uh, inhibition and the green lines are showing activation, okay, or stimulation. What we then do is we apply a logic on top of this. And we, used to, we decided to use a three-state logic. So the three-state logic is you have a value of zero, which is normal. It's comparable to healthy control. Uh, anything that has a value of one, that's, that's higher than healthy control. Anything that's lower than uh, a zero or negative one, that's, that's lower than healthy control. And then we apply this very, very simple logic. I mean, it, it, it looks complex, but it's just because of the way it's written. So what this is saying is that at some future time point for a given node, so take any node out of that system and say, where does it want to be at the next time step? You look at how many activators are are acting on it, how many inhibitors are acting on it. And if you have only activators that are acting on it, and any of those activators are higher than normal, then you want to go higher than normal in the next time step. If you have any inhibitors that are acting on you, and they're higher than normal, then at the next time step, you want to go lower than normal. And if you have a combination of activators and inhibitors, it's whatever one wins out. You have more activators, you go higher. If you have more inhibitors, you go lower. Okay, and then that allows you to tell what the next time step is for the system or the state that the system wants to evolve towards. Now, you can do this for absolutely every state in the system. So you check every single possible combination of 0, 1, negative 1 in that system, and you say from that given uh, state that you're currently in, where do you want to go in the next time step? Now, what you'll find in there is there's cer certain states of the system that don't want to do anything. They will stay at that state indefinitely. Okay, and those are the stable states. Those are those homeostatic basins of attraction. Those are those homeostatic states. Now, when uh, looking at this analysis, we, we combed through for these initial models, we looked at every possible state. So we're talking about three to the power of 14 uh, uh, different states. We're talking millions, millions of states that we went through. As we get to more complex uh, uh, models, we weren't able to do that because we're talking Every time you add a new element, it, it increases the number of states by the system by three. So it exponentially grows into the billions and tens of billions and trillions of, of states. So then we just start to simulate, simulate the model to try and find where does it end up and eventually get a survey of where these homeostatic basins may, may occur. Now in this very simple model, uh, three of those uh, female models uh, produce this sort of uh, pattern here. So these are the stable states available to the system, and these are the markers that are um, within the system. So here, this SS0 state, this corresponds to typical health. Okay, so everything is normal across the board. 
Uh, then you have these alternate states one through four. And so what you have here is you know, low levels of ACTH and high levels of the glucocorticoid receptor dimer and the glucocorticoid receptor itself. Uh, this one here has uh, um, low levels of innate immune cells and uh, innate immune response cytokines, low levels of Th1 cytokines in cells and high levels of Th2 cytokines in cells. Whereas this one has high cortisol, high pro-inflammatory cytokines, low uh, Th2 cytokines in cells, and a suppressed uh, um, gonadal access. Now, in the one phase of the, of the uh, um, female model, we actually have um, additional states, which are shown here five through 10. And these are only available to one model out of the, the four female system, that's female model C. Okay, in that case, we get this alternate state where you have um, hyper, hypo uh, cortisolic state, and again, either a Th1 or a Th2 uh, shifted uh, profile in, in the immune system. So then we want to look, well, what, what is it that we're actually looking at? I mean, these are great, it's an excellent modeling uh, um, exercise. How does it correspond to actual data? So then we have to take our immune measures and our hormone measures uh, uh, and cell count measures from the lab, and then we compare it to the model predictions. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to gauge where does the uh, profile of MECFS for females sit in that attractor landscape? Is it closer to one or the other? Uh, so what we do is we do a comparison of each individual marker in a model uh, predicted homeostatic state and get a degree of alignment. And because we're dealing with a multi-dimensional data space, we use a projection method to project that from this multi-dimensional space down into two dimensions so we can look at it. So this method of salmon projection takes the multi-dimensional space, projects it into two dimension, and where, where it retains the overall general spacing between uh, um, um, points in the, in the uh, comparison. So here we have, um, this is your SS1, SS0 uh, state. Now, because we don't have measures for absolutely everything in our model, we don't have measures for corticotropin-releasing hormone, CRH, or ACTH, because that would involve, you know, getting into the brain. Certain model uh, predicted states uh, collapse onto one another because they're indistinguishable from one another because we, we just don't have the measures to do so. So that's why we get this SS0, SS1 state are together, SS2, SS3, SS5 through 7, and SS8, 9, and 10 are essentially the same as far as the, uh, the data space goes. So when we do the alignment, what we find here is that the, the chronic fatigue uh, syndrome state for women closely aligns with the SS5, SS6, SS7 state, and less closely with this SS2, SS3 state. Now this one here, this one is the, um, the low estrogen, sorry, is the high estrogen, low cortisol, mixed immune profile state. Okay, so we can't distinguish between the immune profile because the measures that we have aren't, aren't strong enough to uh, um, distinguish them. Or in this case, uh, all three of these states are, um, can flip between uh, certain measures. So this seems to suggest something similar to what we, we see in, in MECFS, uh, the hypocortisolic state, uh, as well as this a mixed immune profile. So you can have the same sort of, of um, uh, presentation uh, clinically for, for these individuals. Now this other, but this, these uh, three states here are only available during one phase of the, of the menstrual cycle. So our thinking is that, you know, in some phases of the menstrual cycle, they may be closer to this state, but then when you flip over to other phases of the menstrual cycle, this state disappears and the chronic fatigue syndrome uh, state shifts closer to this SS2, SS3 state, which is uh, characterized more by low estrogen, high cortisol, and increased pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then as the cycle goes through your, uh, um, uh, the, the, the hormone cycle, you're gonna be getting a sloshing back and forth between these. And depending on your, uh, uh, your given parameters within an individual, it may describe a, a, um, an ease or a difficulty of sloshing back and forth between these two. So you may get individuals that get stuck closer to this phase or are stuck closer to this phase. Now, this is, uh, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of speculation here. Again, this is a very limited Im uh, immune model, a very limited uh, wiring model. So we need to better accommodate the complexity and dynamics of this system. And this is the work we've, we've been uh, uh, going through, and this is the work in progress. 
So some things that we've done is we've had added a more detailed immune system. So previously we only had Th1 and Th2 uh, cytokine signaling. We've added in natural killer cells and dendritic cells. We've broken up some of those uh, clusters of, of signaling molecules and cytokines into more um, uh, fine-grained descriptions of, of the uh, signaling molecules. We've added in cytotoxic lymphocytes, T regulatory cells, and the T17 axis. And again, we've done this modeling as well. We've compared it. And we get, we get different uh, measures. So this is very preliminary results. This is stuff that's still active. We're currently trying to, to um, uh, understand this. Again, we have this healthy, stable state. And here we have these two alternate states. So all those different states that we saw before have started to wash away in, in the mix when we start to add more complexity to the system. So what we have now is a state here that's characterized by high levels of cortisol and low levels of estrogen. And it's either a Th17 uh, um, increased response or a T regulatory response in the system. Now, when we compare our data, again, to these uh, model predictions, we find more that it lines up with this elevated T regulatory response. Now, again, we're only capturing one snapshot in time of these models because we've only been looking at T0 rest baseline data. Okay, so what we need to accommodate now is the actual dynamics of the system. We need to tune these models and add the elements into the system that describe the actual dynamics that you would see in a, uh, an actual individual. So that's something that, that Gordon Broderick, oh, sorry, I'll come, I'll come to that in a second. Uh, we've also started to look at um, things that are going on in the brain. So everything that we've talked about before has been a peripheral response. But again, we also have things that are going on in the brain, which is a, a protected compartment. So we have a neuroinflammatory response. So this is work we've done with uh, Jim O'Callaghan's group at the CDC in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we've described a, a model of neuron glial uh, interaction. And what we're trying to do is marry then the uh, brain inflammatory profile to the uh, peripheral profile across the blood-brain barrier. Again, this is, this is work in progress. Now, what uh, Gordon Broderick's group has been working on is trying to capture that, that dynamic aspect of the, uh, of the time course data. So he's, uh, I'm not going to go into it because it, it, this is very preliminary, or not preliminary work, but this is very new work. It's being published uh, uh, as we speak. It's, it's right now in the proof stage of the, of the, um, of the process. Uh, so this, this here, this uh, um, biomodel checker, what this does is it takes these models and it takes actual data and it takes the data and it discretizes it, something so that it looks like this discrete changes in the modeling simulation environment. And what it does then is instead of uh, allowing the, uh, all those interactions between all the elements of the model to be on equal footing, it weights those, those interactions and gives more strength to certain interactions and less strength to, to other interactions. So it makes transitions more likely for some interactions and less likely for other interactions. And in doing so, it changes the parameters of those connections between all the nodes in the system. And it weights them in a way such that when you simulate uh, response of the, of, the, of the model to a given perturbation, such as stress in the exercise challenge, you're trying to reproduce the actual dynamic time course that we're getting from the exercise challenge of, of MECFS subjects. And in doing so, we, we give parameters and tuning to the model. And some of, these, um, uh, some of these homeostatic states will disappear. Some of them will get added. Some of them will be more prominent. And so we're trying to get a more tuned, uh, uh, precise description of the model that's going on. And then using that same constraint satisfaction technique, uh, we can use that to identify minimal intervention sets uh, to identify the, the actual treatment course that would drive the system to go from that alternate uh, mode of behavior back towards a healthy mode of behavior. So ultimate, what we'll, ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to take these models and produce this simulation environment to predict the, the treatment course that we would like to try in clinical trials. So this is an example that we've done with, with Gulf War illness. And so Gulf War illness, uh, the same sort of analysis that we did, but we're doing it on a male system. And the male system was much simpler. We only needed the one uh, model for the uh, uh, male HPG G axis. And what we do is we stimulate the perturbations of the system by, by introducing some sort of chemical agent uh, um, to, um, to change from that start point of the ill homeostatic basin of attraction 
perturb it, and then allow the system to evolve in time. So the Gulf War Illness uh, group, they started with um, a profile that was, uh, had high levels of Th1 uh, cytokine, so interferon gamma IL-2 and TNF-alpha, um, uh, high cortisol and low testosterone. And then we um, perturbed them with a cytokine inhibitor which drove these down. And what the, what the simulation technique uh, found was it optimized, uh, you could not drive this system back towards health with only one intervention. You couldn't just hit somewhere in the immune system, you couldn't hit just somewhere in the endocrine system or in the stress axis. You had to have at least two interventions. And the most minimal intervention was first hitting with um, cytokine inhibition and then following this up with the glucocorticoid receptor inhibition. We took this um, uh, treatment course, we tried it out in an animal model of Gulf War illness. We found that it uh, reduced the neuroinflammatory profile of the Gulf War illness animal model and now we're trying this out in clinical trials um, with uh, males with Gulf War illness and it's showing preliminary uh, results that it's quite promising. Okay, And I've just been given the, the marker that I've only got a minute left. So I'm just going to skip through step three because I didn't think I'd get to it. Okay, so oh, the last thing I want to say is the end game of, of this, these modeling works is to come up with uh, an improved standard of care. So the ultimate goal is to, to come up with some sort of treatment course to help individuals. Now modeling only serves as a guide, okay, it's not a panacea, it doesn't solve everything. Okay, so we're using this to, to drive ideas which we can bring to a clinician and they can decide whether that's a, a reasonable course of action. So only with safety concern, uh, safety confirmed and least invasive strategies identified will these things be moved to clinical trials. So these are not, these are not a catch-all, these are not 100% guaranteed uh, uh, um, treatment courses, these are just guides on where we may want to be looking. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone and uh, open the floor up for questions. Thank you very much. I, th I think we can only take one question, if you don't okay, mind. Okay, that's fine. But people are obviously free to talk to Travis later. Oh. Who had the first? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of pressure on one question. Um, just really intrigued with those 200 odd FDA drugs you identified in, in that screening, uh, often it's much easier to identify drugs that inhibit pathways or gene networks. But um, given your homeostatic balance proposal, which I really like by the way, um, how many of those FDA drugs were actually activators of pathways? Process. For okay, so for for Gulf War illness, I can I can I can talk about that because the MEC of stuff is still in in trial, so I behind closed doors right now. But for the for the Gulf War illness, uh, the both of the treatments were identified. So the the, the dual aspect of driving down the um, uh, the Th1 cytokines and then following it up with a glucocorticoid receptor inhibitor, both of those were identified using the same sort of um, gene expression analysis. And I mean, there, there was multiple ones because that one node actually encompasses three different cytokines. So mu multiple ones were identified in that pathway. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.